can you girls tell me the difference between a nation like ours and a kingdom like England? Go ahead. Our nation is a democracy and kingdoms are monarchies. No, the, you got the right idea though. Kingdoms are ruled by a ruler, a king, or in England's case, a queen. And what, do, when we think of, of, of a ruler, what do we think of their power? What, what kind of things can they do that a president can't? Yeah, they can control the rules. So when we talk about God's kingdom, who are we saying controls the rules? God. But there's a funny thing that happens. Do, do, do people always follow God's rules? Do people always follow the queen's rules in England? No. Because sometimes, even on this earth, kings and queens give people the right to make their own decisions. Do you think that the queen liked the fact that Harry and Meghan moved to the U.S.? I don't think so. I don't think that was something that she said, yeah, go, go ahead and do it. But neither did she say, you can't do it. She gave them room to make their own decision. And that's what God does with us. God gives us room to make our decisions. And sometimes we make good decisions, and sometimes not so much, <laughs> right? And you think of some decisions, you don't have to tell me. Do you, could you think of some decisions you've made that weren't really great? Yeah, I could think of some for me. We all have them. And it's kind of, sometimes we wish that God would not let us make those sorts of bad decisions. We think, you know, God, why didn't you stop me from doing that stupid thing? But that's what God does, is let us make our own mistakes. We have to live with what happens, but we know that God loves us anyway. God forgives us for the trouble we get into and the trouble we cause. And it's our responsibility to think about whether we're doing fits with what God would want or not. That's a pretty big responsibility. Harry and Meghan had a lot to think about before they made their decision. And I'm not saying whether it was a good one or not. But they had a lot to think about because they knew it was important. And all of our decisions are important. So we need to think and make good choices. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving me some freedom. And then being willing to help me get out of the messes I make. And to try to do better next time. Amen. Please pray with me again. Lord, we live in this world and sometimes forget that this world is your kingdom. And we have rules that you would like us to follow. We have a time every moment of every day to make decisions. In this moment of this day, let us listen to your voice. Let your spirit teach us what we need to learn in this hour. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, 
our rock, our redeemer, our ruler. Amen. The Lord's Prayer includes six petitions. It's possible to pray all six without really noticing that implicit in each is both the action of a sovereign God and an active response on our part. This morning's focus will be on the first three of those, sometimes referred to as the thou petitions, thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. These matters encompass the whole world and all time. Our act of praying, though, places us squarely in the middle of that very broad view. The first petition is, hallowed be your name. We don't name or describe God. God does. It's odd how God has always wanted to be known, be personable and approachable, yet didn't want to give Moses a name, but instead be the unknowable, I am who I am. It's the action of a sovereign God that controls that revelation, determines how much we will or won't know about God and God's name. We don't hallow God's name either. God does that too. That happens through the actions God has taken repeatedly to save us and all humanity. It's those actions that reveal a holiness that's there with or without our prayer. That then is our role in this petition. What active response is expected of us? Well, because God is holy, God's people must be holy. Our sinfulness stands in stark and painful contrast to God's holiness. Disobedience that defiles God's name instead of hallowing it. In this petition, we're asking God to demonstrate that divine holiness again by acting in our time, in our situations, to save us from ourselves. Essentially, we're praying Show the world how holy you are, God, by rescuing us from our own sin and turning us into people who serve you and everyone around us. Help keep us from tarnishing your reputation so that your name can shine. Thy kingdom come is the second petition. We pray that one without any real clue about what exactly it is we're praying for. There are too many paradoxes involved, too many opposing ideas all presented to us as true, often by Jesus himself, with no way to reconcile them logically. Jesus talks in one breath about the signs of the kingdom's coming as if they're easy to recognize. And the next he says, the time is a mystery, unknown and un unknowable, even to him. In parables and teachings, Jesus indicates that the kingdom is still far off. Yet salvation comes to Zacchaeus the very day he meets Jesus. 
in one sense, the kingdom arrived the day Jesus was born. It's already come. At the same time, it's obviously not here yet. So it must lie sometime in the future. Choosing one side of any of these contradictions over the other isn't really an option. For both are part of a truth that's bigger and broader and greater than either one of the two sides. We're stuck with paradoxes. God's action will be the sole determiner of when the kingdom will come. Our prayer won't affect the timing, but it may help us live in the creative tension of knowing that somehow all these different perspectives are true. Our prayer may also open our eyes to see different ways the kingdom may show itself in an imperfect church like ours that prepares us to live as citizens of the kingdom and transcends the line between heaven and earth at the communion table. It's seen in political issues that raise peaceable kingdom issues such as peace and justice, equality, ecology. It's there as a great eschatological gift of God at the end of human history. And it's there as a mystical reality that dwells in the hearts of believers who are born again or who worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It's all of those. What the kingdom looks like and how, when and how it will come are dependent on the actions of God. We can pray for its company. That may give us eyes to see ways that it's already here and faith to eagerly anticipate the day of its coming. But a response is also required of us. One that goes far beyond praying for that day. We need to get ready for it. Not just our souls. Our whole world needs work, needs our work. As Kenneth Bailey puts it, the faithful who pray this prayer are not an inward-looking circle praying merely for their own needs. This section of the prayer widens the vision of the worshiper to see beyond individual and community needs and catch a vision for the world throughout human history. You'd think that the power inherent in God's sovereignty would eliminate the need for us to make the third petition, your will be done. If God's in charge, surely God's will will be done, one way or another, even here on earth. God rules just fine in the kingdom of heaven. So our sovereign God is perfectly able to express the divine will and take action to enforce it. That's not the problem. We're the problem. God has given us free will and made us responsible for our own actions. Here on earth, sin interrupts the flow of God's goodwill, God's desire for good for all people. For God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven, 
we need to take the active response of caring as deeply as God does about what's being done in and on and to the God-created planet we live on and what happens to all of the individually God-created people who live on this earth. We're praying for God's will to be done by us. As we pray each of the vow petitions, we don't need to worry about God's ability to handle the matters we raise. We don't need to worry about how things are going up in heaven. We need to worry about the actions required on our part here, now, on earth. In this prayer, Jesus is simply giving us a clear, succinct, direct way to ask God to make us holy as God is holy. To stir us to do everything we can to make this earthly kingdom as much like God's heavenly one as it's possible for us to do and to help us be aware of and to follow God's will in our own lives every day. So let us pray as he taught us in action as well as in words. Amen. <laughs>